So this is not a, a theological treatise on eco-spirituality, just a reflection. And I'll ask you, not let it to go to your head, but rather just what are your feelings and what is your heart saying to you during this, during this one hour session? I want you to look at that picture and I want to, you to imagine your hands holding Mother Earth. Are you holding Mother Earth gently or squeezing Mother Earth? What are our politicians, our leaders doing? Business, our economic systems, our education systems, their hands, what are they doing to Mother Earth? So just be aware of that as we go through this presentation. During these two presentations, I'm going to ask four questions and try and answer them or just reflect on them. And the first two will be this session tonight or this evening or this morning, wherever you are. Where are we and how did we get here? And then next week, what is possible for the future and where do we go from here? But not at a technological level, but all at a spiritual level. So where are we? What is the state of our planet? Now I could show you many videos, but we haven't got time. But the latest IPCC report in March came out and this is a video link to the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, speaking also about this report. And what he said in there, that the world and its peoples are being clobbered by climate change. And the lack of leadership is criminal. This is the words he used. So we all know what is happening from various newspaper reports, etc. So I'm not going to dwell on this, but this is the state of our planet, where we are at the moment. And what are the challenges in the next 20 to 30 years? One would be climate change, the energy crisis, and how we divorced ourselves from fossil fuels. And in particular, the failure of all our institutions, economic, political, cultural, education, religious, to address these crises. These three are all interlinked. And what is happening is social, political, economic inequality, unrest, war, refugees, migrants, pandemics, future pandemics, you can name it, what we see on our news screens every day. So this is where we are. And the challenge is, how do we be people of hope? And added to this is our world population, which in the next 20 years or so to 2050, could reach another 2 billion on our planet to 10 billion. How do we cope? So what I want to stress now is how did we get to this situation? And to ask you that personally is, what is your spirituality? What gets you up in the morning to do what you do? What is that inner driving force in your heart that gets you to do what you do? That is your spirituality and yet can play out or lead to some religious practice or whatever. For some, the driving force and what they get up to in the morning is to make more money or to buy more property. That is a symptom of some driving force inside them that is not good. 
So what is our spirituality that led us as individuals and as our world community to get where we are? So I'd like to just address that slowly and reflectively. So to do this, we're going to have to ask some of these big, deep questions. Where did everything come from? Who made the world? Why are we here? What is our purpose in life? And to answer these deep questions, we can do it in two ways. We can do storytelling, and we can look at modern science, what modern science is telling us. But the big debate at the moment with science and religion, science and religion try to answer different questions about the origin of the earth and humankind. And in the modern world, each needs the other. Science is knowledge obtained through our senses, what we see, what we can look at, what we can measure, matter. But it doesn't answer the deep question of why. And that is our faith, a leap in the dark, mystery. And a famous scientist said the following, Science without religion is lame, and religion without science is blind. And that was Albert Einstein. Now, every culture and every age has had creation stories or creation myths. And a myth is an imaginative story that uses symbols, to speak about a reality, but a reality that is beyond our understanding. And many cultures, ancient and modern, have creation myths that provide ways of thinking about the mystery of the universe and the world and of our presence in it. And the one that we often look to is the creation story in our scripture, the Old Testament. And this was based on biblical cosmology of the time. The picture there tries to depict that, the heavens above, the ocean in the heavens, the firmament, the earth, the water under the earth, the ocean, etc. And so we have the Genesis story day one to day seven. We all have read this so often. And this sequence is also found in the Babylonian creation story. And scholars would say that the Genesis story was written or was put down after the Babylonian captivity. But it's not a scientific story. It's a mythological story to try and give meaning to what they were experiencing. And when, what you can take out of this when you read it is, and God saw that it was good. And God saw that it was very good. But how have we looked after our planet? So maybe the challenge is this, we read in Genesis 1.28, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. And boy, I think we've done that. And what has led to that? And maybe it's our hierarchical order of trying to understand things that in the hierarchy of everything, we've got inorganic matter. And then above that is the animals and the plants, then human beings, then the angels or the spirit world, and God, a transcendent being, manipulating everything below. 
or controlling everything. Maybe that is what we have taken as our driving force. And even with the human being, we divide up into spirit, mind, and body. And many philosophers have done this. I think, therefore I am. But this hierarchical order might lead to some sort of practice. And these words might depict that. This hierarchical order, we have ideas about God, transcendence, dualism, patriarchy, separation, fear of the other, aloneness, individual autonomy, power over, control, status, ownership, property. Just think of those words. What are you feeling? What is your heart saying? And this maybe depicts where we are in our world of today. Modern conditioning has enslaved us all to various forms of tribalism. And I put that in inverted commas, around religion, around ethnicity, around nationhood. We define our identity over and against everybody else. Is that true of our situation today? Now we're gonna move forward to our modern age. <clears throat> and we've got incredible scientific instruments one being the Hubble telescope that's been floating out in space since 1990, and recently the Webb telescope launched in December 2021. And the Hubble telescope based on a, a, an astronomer, Ernest Hubble, and he looked through his own telescope on Earth, and he worked out that our universe is expanding. And if you take that and work it backwards, if it's expanding, then it must have started from some point. So these scientific instruments have increased our ability to interpret and to see and to answer the question, what is happening? So I'm going to take you now and show you a little movie about the awakening universe. It's about 15 minutes long but I have to stop sharing just to get the sound right. So excuse me first to do that. So I'm going to start it now. So just relax and see what is coming to your heart, your feelings. We will be alienated from the universe until we have a story, an adequate story of the universe that tells the story of the human as well as the story of everything else because it's part of one single process that's been going through a sequence of transformative episodes. This idea of an emergent universe is very, very new. There is no culture, no tradition, no sage, no prophet that could know that the way our generation is blessed to know it. When we begin to realize this tremendous sense of time that's orienting us and space that's grounding us, we are energized in a new way to take responsibility for the planet and its ecosystems. In other words, our response to the magnificence of cosmology and this story 
is a responsibility to its continuity. The universe story shows how profoundly related we are. It shows that we are involved with each other and have been for a long time. So it is not the case that the earth was, was assembled and then we were added to the earth and it was there for our purposes. Rather, we came out of the earth. For millions of years, every morning on Earth has dawned upon a world of greater biological diversity than the day before. In her endless journey around the sun, our sweet and generous Earth has brought forth an ever-increasing expression of complexity and sophistication, of beauty and wonder. Now, after eons of more and more, suddenly there is less and less. In a geological instant, the vitality of our Earth has plummeted. Every one of our vital life systems is showing signs of a serious and precipitous decline. So serious that most biologists now agree that we are in the midst of what they call a mass extinction event. The last time that happened was 65 million years ago when an asteroid ended the reign of the dinosaur. But now the cause is an asteroid. For it is the impact of human activity, specifically technological industrial civilized human activity, that is literally destroying our planetary life support system. Are we being alarmists? You bet, because this news is alarming, and alarms are designed to warn us of danger and to wake us up. It's time to ask some serious questions, like what spell have we fallen under that would allow us to destroy the very system upon which we rely for our own survival? And how do we break that spell? If we are going to find our way to a workable future, it might be wise to first go back to the distant past. All the way back to what science currently views as the beginning of everything. Imagine nothing. Not space, not darkness, not even a vast emptiness, but nothing. Now, imagine everything. In a stupendous explosion of light, heat, and energy radiating out in every direction, the universe erupted into existence 13.7 billion years ago. We can see that everything that ever was, is, or will be was compressed into a space smaller than a seed, tinier than a tear, more minuscule than a molecule. All space, all time, and the potential for everything that would ever exist started as a single point. So in a very real sense, science has discovered what indigenous people have known all along. We are all one. We are all connected. We all come from the very same source. This massive fireball continued expanding, eventually cooling enough for the very first atoms to form. If the expansion had just been a little bit slower, the universe would have collapsed into an enormous black hole. Or if the expansion had just been a little bit faster, the universe would have expanded just too fast for the galaxies to form, and so we'd have simply dust. If you altered the expansion just one millionth of one percent, the entire universe would collapse. So it, it, what it suggests is that there is a, there's a profound a wisdom at work in the universe. Then, in a cosmological wink of an eye, a hundred billion galaxies swirled into being. We didn't know there were any galaxies in the universe. 
100 years ago. We thought maybe there was just one. Now we realize there's 100 billion galaxies. So we're just beginning to understand some of the dynamics of galaxies. And to think that they actually have intrinsically the intelligence or the, or the ordering power to bring forth all of this elegance. And so the galaxies themselves, you know, they, they organize all the material and give birth to new stars. And when, when the scientists really began to look at the galaxies this way, they realized they're even something like a living cell. That's news. That's another way of imagining our way into the universe. And now these whirlpools of galactic creativity begin to fulfill their cosmic destiny as they each give birth to a hundred billion stars. When these first stars reach the end of their life cycle, they collapse in on themselves and erupt into immense cosmic explosions called supernovas. Thomas Berry refers to the supernova event as a cosmological moment of grace. He calls it a great sacrificial moment because the death of the star is what enables all future life to evolve. The supernova embodies the archetype of death and rebirth. It's a mythic moment on a cosmic scale. Out of these clouds of stardust, billions of second generation stars are born. One of them was the star we call our sun. Left over from the formation of the sun was a wisp of debris that swirled itself into a necklace of nine spinning planets, the jewel of which was the swirling mass of molten lava that was to become our home, the Earth. Out here, on a tiny planet suspended in perfect equipoise, the force that set the galaxy spinning and ignited the stars produced its next miracle, a universe within the universe. It was the birth of life. Now this miraculous manifesting force began to clothe itself in biology, expressing itself in increasingly complex and sophisticated expressions of beauty and elegance. Earth, as we see her now, five billion years after that initial experience, has arrived at such a complexity, such a development, such a journey of that original fireball that she is now alive in her own right. In other words, the universe in Earth has reached a complexity in which universe awakens into life and is alive. Think about it. Everything we see around us has developed from the boiling cauldron of the early Earth, a sphere of lava that miraculously gave rise to the sea and the atmosphere, and then life in its infinite expressions. As Brian Swim says, the Earth was once molten rock and now sings operas. So all creativity and all consciousness arises in some mysterious way from the depths of the earth itself. Right into the heart of this immense celebration of biological creativity, the universe produced its next surprise. An upright tool-using primate with an opposable thumb and the remarkable ability to reflect on its own existence. In essence, after nearly 14 billion years, the universe had created a way to become aware of itself. We are the universe reflecting on itself. We are Earth become conscious. And this changes everything. Human beings lived in harmony with nature for eons, until they discovered how to cultivate crops and domesticate animals. While most humans continued on in their nomadic ways, some chose to settle in one place. And in a mere 10,000 years, they created everything we now consider to be human history.
Why out of stardust has this come to be? Why birdsong? Why green? Why the lushness of palm and the stability of cypress and the grandeur of the mountains? And why the oceans with their billions of teeming life forms? We are part of a journey so much more than we ever could even imagine. As we move into this understanding, we have a new identity of ourselves as cosmological beings. We're not just Americans, we're not just French, we're not just Democrats, we're not in any small category. We are the universe in the form of a human, and it's true of everyone. It's an amazing new understanding of ourselves that is so profoundly inclusive. And everyone is part of this. Everything is part of this. And we, we discover as well a profound kinship that no matter what being we're talking about on the planet, we are related. We're related in terms of energy. We're related in terms of genetics. We're all in one way or another like, like a form of kin. And that, I just, um, it's overwhelming. So it's just now coming into human awareness. It's going to take a lot of reflection to embody this fully, but it is a massive change in human consciousness. The universe arose and gave rise to the galaxies. The galaxies gave rise to the stars. Our sun gave rise to the earth, and the earth gave rise to life and to all that we are. And now it is causing us to awaken from our dream of lonely isolation so we may rejoin the great community of life and take on our part in this stupendous unfolding story. As Thomas Berry says, this is our great work. Thank you, everyone. I'd like you to be aware now of just what you're feeling. Thomas Berry said, this is our great work. He also said, this is our sacred story. The web of life as we now know it. And if we put our spirituality into it, God is in everything and everything is in God. And if we break this web of life, what happens to our mother earth? So if we reflect on this, what type of words can we express this, uh, this understanding? Experiencing God, awe, mystery, interconnectedness, relational, community, diversity, creative spirit, interiority, possibility, interrelatedness, and any other words that come to you that might express all this. I want you to just look at this now. St. Thomas Aquinas, the universe is the first book of God's revelation. Ever before any sacred text was written, God was self-revealing through the unfolding universe story. And a mistake in our understanding of creation will necessarily cause a mistake in our understanding of God. Creation is an ongoing evolutionary process. And God's revelation of God's self through creation is a dynamic, ongoing process. And we take part in this. And revelation never ends.
Now, what can we learn from this universe story, this new sacred story? And there are three things. Differentiation and uniqueness, interiority, subjectivity, or personhood, if you'd like to use that, and communion and relationship. And in modern parlance, think of this as like God's operating system, how God reveals God's self in the soul's story. So the first one I want to look at is differentiation. You look at those flowers, everyone is different. Everything in the universe is totally unique and different in our world. Think of our, of our thumbprints. And at the heart of the universe is an outrageous bias for the novel, for the, for the surprising. And what does this challenge us to do? We learn that we need to celebrate difference. How do I see differentiation in my own life? Do I see it among the people that I live in, that I live with? Do I nurture it or do I, I inhibit it? I don't think our world does very good on this issue of difference. How can we celebrate and incorporate it in the way that we live? The next one is interiority or personhood. We learn that we have to res respect everything and all the creation and all its peoples with reverence. Everything is sacred. And our inner experiences are made more profound by what we experience externally. The variety and beauty of creation around us evokes a sense of awe, mystery, and the sacred within us. How do I cherish others' capacity to, be, to become? How do I encourage others towards their full potential? What are the implications of all of this for the way I'm being called to live? And there's a little story about Snoopy having so much potential and being challenged. Why don't you do anything? Because I don't want to use it up. So the challenge is, do we use our inner ability to become the full potential that we are meant to be? and allow our earth and its biological systems that same right. Communion. Everything is in connected in mutual interdependence. Nothing attains its full potential without its interconnectedness. And I want to share with you this beautiful African way of thinking called Ubuntu. Things, beings cannot be envisioned simply in their isolated selves, for nothing is itself without everything else. I am not fully myself without everything else. I am because you are. Isn't that beautiful? And then communion. We are invited to walk humbly, act justly, and love tenderly. What do my daily choices about living and living say about communion? How do I see myself living this art in my daily interactions with people and all creation.
the challenge. What we have to realize that transformation only takes place through great love and suffering. Think of a mother bringing up her baby, her child, the amount of love she shares with that child. But the amount of energy and capacity to do this, and you might call it suffering energy that she needs to do this, what she has to go through to bring up that child. But that is positive suffering, not the negative suffering our bad choices and actions do. And very often we blame God for those things. So transformation takes place through love, suffering, energy, the ability to keep going, keep doing this. So we are all governed by laws we did not devise, laws we cannot revise, laws to which we too are subject. God works through the laws and processes of nature. That's how God reveals God's self. Earth does not belong to us. We belong to earth. We come from it. We are sustained by it. And in the end, we return to it. So how does an understanding of the emerging universe story impact upon how we live? And how do we make the principles of differentiation, interiority, and communion a reality in our lives? Now, I just want you to look at that screen and for one minute, just put your thoughts in the chat box. So this now is the last slide of this uh, reflection. And remember we are seeing, we're discussing that second question, how did we get to where we are in our world of today? So I'm gonna put a summary of the two worldviews ref we've reflected on in this presentation. So on the left-hand side, maybe some of the beliefs in our current worldview, the earth was created for us to use as we wish. There's a radical discontinuity between the human and the non-human. We humans are the ultimate goal of creation. The earth is infinite, can support continuous economic growth. The situation today is normal. We can keep on this path indefinitely. And on the right hand side, some implications for our functional worldview, given our new understandings. The earth is a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects. The earth is primary, the human is derivative. Nothing is itself without everything else. All creativity is a sacrament revealing the presence of God. Life and non-life intertwine in an exquisite dance. Neither is primary nor secondary. We are genetically related, related to every creature who has ever lived on earth and to every creature living now. We need to live sustainably and in harmony with earth systems. Now I want you to look at those two scenarios. And where are you? Where are we? Where is our earth community? And if we're really honest with ourselves, we are somewhere in the middle. We aspire to go to the right, but many of our actions and choices pull us back to the left. And this is our daily struggle. Thomas Wharton would call it our salvation story, trying to aspire to what we need to aspire to. I want you also to think, where are our systems in our world, our political, governmental, economic, religious, educational systems? Think of some politicians in our world, where are they? What are they operating out of? Pope Francis has challenged us towards the right. Think of where are our law systems? 
most law systems would give personhood status just to the human and the corporation. Everything else is property to be bought and sold. And so we can speak about genocide, but we don't speak about geocide, what we do to our earth, or ecocide, biocide, what we do to biological life. The challenge of changing our laws. So now Tino is going to put you in um, breakaway rooms. And I want you just for a couple of minutes to think of this and share with each other and maybe then put some reflections in the chat box. Thank you, Tino. Oh, so thank you, everyone. Um, next week, we'll look at the other two questions. What can we do? Where can we go from here? From a spiritual point of view, I will be looking at just a few quotations of Pope Francis in Laudato Si, the spirituality aspect of it, and then a few videos challenging us and what is holding us back. And the big thing is the fear inside of ourselves, how we deal with that. So that's what next week is going to be about. I deal with it in terms of a sacramental approach, what we break open and share each day to challenge us to live Eucharistically. So that's how I'm going to look at that. So I hope people can join us next week again. Thank you so much for participating and for your wonderful reflection. I really do appreciate that.